Hello and welcome to the H-Friendly Seattle Virtual Coffee Hour, a partnership with the Seattle Public Library. My name is Lenny Orlov. I'm a fully trained barista and a former library employee and will be your host this morning. I'm also a native speaker of Russian, which is one of the seven languages available during the live stream and on YouTube. The other six languages are Arabic, Chinese, English, Korean, Spanish, and Vietnamese. Please take a moment right now and uh, click under the video, click on the CC, and then uh, click on the gear that's to the right of it to select one of these languages and adjust caption size, contrast, and other options. So while I am not making delicious lattes or hosting virtual events for older adults. I coordinate the H Friendly Seattle program in Seattle's Human Services Department in the Aging and Disability Services Division. Our goal at H Friendly Seattle is to make this city a great place to grow up and grow old. For more information, including the eight domains of livability, more on which later on the show, we invite you to visit seattle.gov forward slash AFS. So in addition to hosting, I also produced the show in a very literal sense. If you notice the mouse movements um, while you're watching the presentations uh, on your screen, that's me working behind the virtual scenes. It's not something we can make disappear at, at the time uh, uh, in Microsoft Teams, but I'm sure they're working on it very hard. Also in our virtual studio, we have two other folks from Human Services Department. They are Michael Taylor Judd, who is a public relations specialist in our external affairs division, and Harrison Lee. He is an undergraduate intern uh, in our own aging and disability services division. Um, so during the live stream, we welcome you and invite you to leave a comment in the Q&A window that's on the right hand side um, to the right of your video. Michael and Harrison well, will be looking at that uh, input and collect it and either reply to you directly or pass it along to one of our presenters. If you're joining us by phone, and I'm looking over because that's set up on the, on the side here, uh, we'll pause periodically so you too could share your thoughts on the stream. And if you are watching the June 18th recording on YouTube, we hope that you'll leave a comment below the video. We hope that you'll like it and also subscribe to the H-Friendly King County or Aging King County rather uh, on YouTube. We do upload all of our weekly shows along with other content produced by the Area Agency on Aging for Seattle and King County. Thank you. We, we really look forward to you joining us, our online community. So before continuing with our program, I'd like to pause to acknowledge what's going on in communities across our nation. This is an image from a live stream depicting protesters in Seattle's Capitol Hill neighborhood occupying Cal Anderson Park and installing a symbol of the Black Lives Matter movement. Tomorrow is June 19th, also known as Juneteenth, the date of an 1865 federal order announcing the end of slavery in the United, in the state of Texas, which was several years after the Emancipation Proclamation. It then took 100 years until the Civil Rights Act of 1964, until that was passed. And now, almost 60 years later, we still have work to do as a country. At City of Seattle, we believe that Black Lives Matter and are committed to dismantling systemic racism and building an equitable governing structure in its place. You may have noticed that most of the 
folks in this image are wearing masks. They're out there fighting the pandemic of racism while trying to stay safe in the midst of COVID-19. A pandemic that disproportionately affects Black and Latino communities in the United States. Washington State Department of Health does want to remind everyone that health-wise, staying home is still safest and encourages folks that do go out to wear a face covering, maintain social distancing, and keep your hands clean to the extent possible. They are also urging anyone that thinks that they have COVID-19 symptoms to get tested. This is a screenshot from their website, which is coronavirus.wa.gov. There is also a health assistance hotline at 1-800-525-0127. Please keep checking this website, coronavirus.wa.gov, for updates, or call them at 1-800-525-0127, excuse me, if you have any questions about this. And with any questions related to aging or disability, please call 1-844-348-5464 and speak to a Community Living Connections advocate who will connect you to a community resource. These are community organizations that are contracted with the City of Seattle to provide information and assistance, caregiver support, and many other services. Again, the number is 1-844-348-5464. You may also visit them on the web at communitylivingconnections.org to see the list of participating organizations and learn about the full range of services that these organizations provide. Again, communitylivingconnections.org. So, did I mention that we have a great show for you this morning? Uh, I hope that you will uh, sit back uh, and enjoy a beverage of choice. Um, as uh, we get a word from our partner, the Seattle Public Library. Um, Nancy Sloat uh, uh, is, is someone uh, I've known for a little while um, by running these events in person. These weren't always virtuals. They actually date back more than probably a dozen years. Uh, and recently in 2020, we moved this show, um, this, this in-person show into the central branch in downtown. And we really do hope we can return there someday soon. But for now, uh, let me turn it over to Nancy for a brief update on what the library is up to, you know, today. Nancy, thank you so much for stopping by. Um, you are live on the show, so please go ahead and unmute your microphone. All right, I am unmuted. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much, Lenny, for uh, letting me have a few minutes here to talk about um, what's happening during the summer at the library. Um, and I also just wanted to say how much we appreciate the partnership with Age Friendly and Aging and Disability Services. Um, I think that one thing that everybody wants to know is when our buildings are going to reopen again. So right now we don't have a specific date for people to come, the public to come into the buildings, but um, we are getting staff back into the buildings right now to help process and get back on the shelf the over 400,000 items that are checked out at this point. We also had to figure out ways to quarantine those materials to keep everybody safe. And when we go to stage two of the opening in King County, then um, we will have limited public services, which we will be starting with curbside delivery of materials um, at selected branches. So moving, moving on, um, I think the most important thing to know is that we are still available, even though the buildings are closed, to answer your questions. Um, you can come in by phone 
um, if that's easiest, or if you prefer something electronic, you can email us or um, you can chat with us. Sometimes the phone is still the fastest way to get a hold of us and to get your questions answered. Uh, could you do the next slide, Lenny? So besides answering questions, of course, we have a huge set of digital resources, and I'm sure that many of you have found found them. And but besides our ebooks and our e audio books, we have some fabulous streaming services where you can stream and download to your device. Um, I've been particularly happy with streaming movies over the last three months and listening to lots and lots of audiobooks. Um, on my phone. Uh, if you have actually any uh, questions about how to use any of these digital resources, please uh, phone us or email us and we'll be happy to help you get set up. Next slide, please. And best of all, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that it's all free with a library card. And I know that some people might not have a library card and during this closure period we have a system for getting you a card that will um, allow you access to all the digital materials so just um, phone us or email us and we'll tell you how to do that and you will be able to get almost instant access to all of our digital materials would you do the next slide so I think that people want to know what's happening this summer. And in the next slide, one of the most fun things for adults is our adult summer bingo. Um, this is a program that's been going on for four or five years, and our partner is the Seattle Arts and Lectures. And basically, you can go to our website and print, find this card and print it. And then you read books that fit the categories. I've just shown you the top, top row of categories, but there are 25 categories of books. And when you get it, you write the title of the book that you've read. And then when you get a bingo, five across or five down or five diagonally, you can submit your name for a prize. And if you get all of the 25 um, uh, parts filled in, then there's an even bigger prize um, if you've done that and you can submit your name for that. So this should keep you busy and it goes through the end of the summer. The other fun thing is that if you um, find that um, card um, electronically and you click on it on each square, you will get a book list of suggested titles. Thanks. So now we can go to the next slide. We also just launched a great new program called Your Next Job, where you can get one-on-one -on -one appointments to look at building your resume and um, uh, beefing up your job skills uh, and also strategies for job searching. And then the next slide. Are you able to do the next slide, Lenny? Great. And we also have our library to business. I wanted to remind everybody for all kinds of small businesses. Again, you can get a one on one appointment with trained business librarians to help you um, use the library resources that would help you with marketing information and also referrals to other technical and business assistance organizations. So the next slide, please. And then we've got some great arts programs for those who are 50 plus, but really it's it's an intergenerational program. We have um, we have arts programs, live interactive arts programs almost every day, five days a week. So just go to our calendar and you will find those and a way to register for those. And then finally, we have some other programs that are older programs like our virtual English circle, which is a very informal gathering to practice English language skills. And then uh, the final slide. We're just doing that. I just wanted to let you know that you can easily get to our calendar for programs for those of us who are older at uh, spl.org forward slash 50 plus and spell out 50 plus. 
So thank you so much, uh, Lenny. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the library and what you can find there. And we will be open soon. Thanks. Lenny, you're on mute. Thank you, Harrison. I was just thinking, um, thanking Nancy for her uh, partnership and for um, for everything that the library is doing, even as the branches are closed. Uh, so, um, you know, before moving on to our next or to our main event, I'd like to invite you all to come back next week. Um, and our show that airs on all other Thursdays, not just the third Thursday of the month, like the coffee hour, is called Close to Home, Stories of Health, Tech and Resilience. Um, it's, it's a companion show. It's, it's a little bit shorter. It's uh, only 45 minutes, but it features folks from the community in addition to, you know, government um, leaders uh, like we will be meeting today. Uh, you can find it at the same time, uh, 1030 a.m. Pacific in the same place, uh, bit.ly slash agefriendlylive. Uh, and there you can actually learn uh, a lot more about uh, both of these virtual programs or anything else that will, you know, ever uh, do. Even if we go back to uh, some sort of in-person programming, we'll probably still have a virtual component to it. On June 25th, we'll get an update from um, Donna Smith on re regional transportation and hear from Mike Bryant on how to stay active even as we stay close to home. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our first guest, Ginger M. Brewster. And I promised I wouldn't say her name incorrectly, but I just did. So let me try it again. Ginger M. Brewster. So, Hello. Yeah. I, hi, hey. Ginger. Hi so, there. I have a uh, I have a bio here for you that I'm um, going to read for folks. Uh, Ginger, uh, as City of Seattle's Chief Privacy Officer, uh, Ginger leads a team of privacy specialists in the execution of the city's privacy program. Following a principles-based approach to the city's management of the public's personal and sensitive information. Prior to this role, she worked for Microsoft on an international team of privacy specialists to resolve issues associated with multi-million dollar marketing initiatives. She spent the first 20 years of her career working in sales and marketing for Fortune 500 companies such as IBM, Hewlett Packard, and Johnson & Johnson, as well as several medical technology startup companies. Ginger completed her undergraduate degree in political science from Barnard College at Columbia University. As a recipient of the National Science Foundation Scholarship for Service Program CyberCorps, she earned her master's degree in infrastructure planning and management from the University of Washington in 2013, focusing on critical infrastructure cyber resiliency. So at this time, I'm going to uh, welcome you to the program, Ginger, and you're live. Here we are. I wish we could be in person. That's the hardest part of this pandemic, I think, is losing that sense of community by being together. But I really want to thank you, Lenny, for reaching out uh, to the Information Technology Department. Two of us will speak to you today. I'm going to talk about privacy uh, and really, really thank you for letting us be part of your conversation. Uh, just as a quick overview, and Will is, more, is closer to this than I am, but we have over 700 people working in information technology. We've been supporting the city as they have switched to telework. We support uh, 34 or so departments, over 12,000 people in various capacities to be 
online and continue to provide services for the city. So um, my side of the house is about policy and about making sure we meet our commitments about how we uh, handle pro the public's personal information. And we collect a lot of information to deliver critical and needed services. So I'm going to take you through an overview. I think I have about 10 minutes to do that. So if you'll sit, uh, switch to the next slide, Lenny, I will continue. Okay, so this slide speaks to the principles. We, in my, um, in my bio, we talk about being a principles-based organization, and that's what this speaks to. Uh, in 2014, then councilman, um, council member Bruce Harrell and the then mayor recognized that the public uh, were getting concerned about the amount of information that the city was collecting, as you should be with a digital world uh, as it is. There's a lot of information we collect. I think at one point my boss said, we have something like the equivalent online of 20 million file cabinets of data that we have collected over the years. Um, and that's, that's something we have to manage appropriately. And so they determined that we should start a privacy program to speak to how we manage information, sharing that with the public uh, to be transparent and to provide uh, a, a way to talk about data in a way that hopefully will build trust. So our mission is the middle piece here. We work to find a fair balance between gathering information to provide needed services and protecting the public's privacy at the same time. So it's definitely a balancing act. And in 2015, by resolution, the council approved the following privacy principles, and those are the numbered items you see on the right. We value your privacy. We give it value understanding. It's important to the person's identity and can be stolen. Uh, we limit data collection. So wherever possible, we collect the minimum that we can. We tell you when and how we use the information we collect. We protect what we collect. That speaks to cybersecurity. We tell you how we share information and with whom, what agencies, what organizations, and how we have to do that legally and by policy. And finally, we allow the public to update information as possible for accuracy. Some information you give us because you want services and some information we take because you're involved in utilities, you have a utilities uh, bill, or you interact with public safety. And so we want to give as many options as possible about how data is collected. But these, these are our principles and we have built a program about managing data based on this. And what my team does, I have four other people, we look at all the new technologies that we bring into the city and programs and, and processes uh, across the whole city and we take a look at those and balance them against our privacy principles. We have a, an online review process. We consult with different departments to talk about making sure we're meeting these privacy principles in any new technologies or programs that will collect public data. So that's what we do. We're busy all day long, uh, and I'll go into some more detail in the next slide. So there's a lot of legislation and regulatory, what I will call frameworks, uh, around data and how it is collected. So the first uh, dot here, we're going to speak to legislation and regulation. This alphabet soup in this first point speaks to really industry or sector-based laws or regulations abound data, around data that's collected. The first two, HIPAA may be familiar, that's how we uh, as a nation address healthcare information, high tech is the technical side of that. The next two, FERPA and COPA, uh, deal with student and uh, people who are under 13, how data is collected online. And the last one, payment card information, PCI speaks to how you do online commerce. There's a lot more and we are, we are liable for many of these uh, as we collect data that uh, is in this category. So we're looking at compliance to those, that alphabet soup I like to call it. The next one is a little more local. It speaks to the Public Records Act, and you may be familiar with that. It's, it was uh, put in place in 1972. It's been amended since. It's the Sunshine Law that provides transparency and accountability about how government collects your data. You can ask for just about anything with very little exempted uh, that the government collects. The next two are local, the next three are local ordinances uh, that the city has put in place. The intelligence ordinance has been in place for I think 15 or 20 years. It speaks to how police uh, gather intelligence in the course of investigations and the work they do. The surveillance ordinance includes police but includes any department that collects or uses technology uh, that meets the definition of surveillance. This was put in place after uh, some protests a few years back and wanted to have uh, council and public oversight about how we do surveillance in the city. 
And surveillance is defined as any technology that uh, analyzes, monitors, or tracks identifiable individuals in a way that could uh, impact their civil liberties. So it, it doesn't look at any one department, it looks over the entire city. And finally, we have a law that's very specific to something that was put in place a couple years ago, advanced metering infrastructure. Those are those new boxes that Seattle City Light put on every, every place that has utility service uh, to be more granular and modern about how it, how it does billing. But there's specific laws about that information to protect how it may be used. Since it, it, it's so personal, how you're using your electricity can dictate whether you're home or what you're up to. So these are some of the laws that we work with uh, that help dictate what we do in addition to our privacy principles. Next slide, please. So that we weigh against what I like to call a smart city shopping list. How are cities modernizing, helping us be more connected, using data to make good decisions about how we use our public resources and public dollars? And this is a lot on here, but this speaks to, we've looked at probably every one of these technologies to see if they are appropriate and how we would put them in place at the city. Automated license plate readers help us figure out how long it takes you to get from place to place as you're traveling throughout Seattle. Uh, they're also used for, for law enforcement. Uh, Body-worn cameras we've been hearing a lot about in the news lately because it is used as an accountability tool when police interact with the public. Uh, CCTV or closed circuit television speaks to uh, the cameras we have that SDOT uses to know what's going on uh, uh, throughout the corridor. A bunch of these drones, environmental sensors, facial recognition, gunshot detectors, some of these are used for policing. Many of them are used in other ways. All of them have implications about the data they collect. And the thing to remember is the biggest privacy issue is where you are in time and space. So anything that collects location information and attaches it to an identifiable person has big privacy implications. And almost all of these do exactly that. So we look at all of these in the course of our business and whether a department is interested in these. And if you click to the next page. These are some of the specific things I've done and I've been at the city doing this role since 2017. These are some of the technologies we have looked at, reviewed and found ways to what we call mitigate privacy risk lessen privacy risk as we use some of these technologies. Information kiosks, people that want to interact and get information about what the city services may be at a certain department. Traffic management, how we make decisions about whether and how you move around the city when you're on uh, either our, um, uh, your private vehicles or in transit. And is there a question? Yeah, I can answer a question if you like. I can hold for a moment. Oh, OK, if you have a question for me, let me know. Um, uh, social media monitoring, this comes up as we want to be uh, responsive to how people are reacting to the city and not just in uh, policing, where that certainly can have a place, but also we have departments who want to know what are people thinking about library services, maybe? What are people thinking about Department of Neighborhood offerings? What about community centers? What about Seattle Center? They want to know what people are saying in social media because people don't always take the time to let us know directly. Situational awareness speaks to cameras. Our traffic operations center needs to know what's happening so that we can adapt to accidents or events or incidents around the city and help us change lighting or change timing uh, for getting people around town. Bike share or any of the mobility, micro mobility is what they call it. Uh, so scooters and bikes, how do we get that information that can tell you where you've been and where you're going, but how can we use that to help us determine uh, what we should be doing in a, and uh, changing in our, in our environment for transportation? And finally, people counters at community centers help us determine staffing needs and what's going on uh, that we are providing services through some of those means. So these are all technologies that I have looked at that we have done privacy reviews for, and we have done what we call privacy impact assessments and publish those um, to uh, let people have an idea about how do we use this information? Who do we share it with? How do we protect it? We have public records laws, but we also have records retention laws that tells us we have by a city have to hold on to information for a while. Um, and so final slide.
Oh, uh, two more, sorry. Uh, this one speaks to uh, the things that have happened just this year. So while we've looked uh, at those technologies I mentioned in the past, this year has brought special information and special uh, focus. And this is interestingly for a privacy person, probably the first time in my life that in my career here and in my life that we've been focused on the same issues around the world. As we've dealt with the pandemic and now as we've dealt with protest and unrest, all of these things are happening at the same time and we're all talking about them at the same time. And if you look in the newspaper now or your online source of news, you'll see articles about all of these. Teleworking, we went from uh, in office at the city rate right, and so many businesses in office doing our work together in a shared office space to teleworking. And we had to turn on a dime at IT. And that has implications for the information we collect and also just general privacy on public records. COVID tracking. We're all trying to figure out how do we make ourselves safer as we try to go out into the community. We do first responder health tracking, but we also are looking at, as we have uh, uh, worked with uh, University of Washington for doing testing, that tracks healthcare information. So how do we do that in a, in a way that is privacy protecting? And finally, surveillance, uh, helping us know from a public safety point of view what's happening that we need to be responsive to protecting people and property and balancing that against the right to protest and the right to be uh, heard. So these are all very active areas that we're involved in. And now we go to the final slide. And this is just the beginning of the conversation. There's so I could be here for three hours. We could talk for hours and you're probably a lot of questions about what we're up to in IT. We do have a privacy website uh, that's available. If you just type in Privacy Seattle, it'll bring up this website, www.seattle.gov tech, and you can and follow the lead. Uh, that will give you information about our program. If, if you wanna reach out to us directly with a question that you have, privacy at seattle.gov is our email inbox and we answer those uh, as promptly as we can with my staff and myself. And finally, the state of Washington has an excellent privacy website. If you have questions on more at a state level uh, or you want information about how to secure your own property or your business, they have a lot of resources online that are just terrific. So I can stop here and answer questions. Let me know what I can do. All right, thank you so much, Ginger. Uh, we appreciate your, your time and, and you uh, stopping by today. Um, we, we did have one question, but while, um, uh, before we go there, mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, like to invite, invite folks to continue typing questions in the Q&A um, so that we can go ahead and uh, get those answered. Normally we'd go to the phone lines, but it doesn't look like there's any questions there. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Harrison for that first question that came in. Harrison. Uh, thanks, Lenny, and thanks, Ginger. Mm -hmm. um, we had one question come in from Carol, and it says, I'm concerned about a request for information about union from the so-called Freedom Foundation, which I understand is a far right wing group. I object to having my information and that of my coworkers. Mm -hmm. How can we be protected from this invasive request? Carol, that's a hard one uh, because that's the balance between freedom of speech and a public employee uh, having to be responsible to those requests. And so a lot of legal advice went into this, and I think it's not the first time that, that this organization or other organizations have asked for information. Um, Part of the Public Records Act uh, is uh, making information available that would be of interest to the public. Unfortunately, in this case, that means um, some personal information about employees. They will be reaching out if they do through the email address they have, which is your, your employee email address. Uh, and they have the right to do to make that request for information and they have the right to reach out uh, to us that way. So we've been working closely with law to make sure we're following what we need to do and not doing anything more. And unfortunately, that's the price we pay for balancing the right of, of individuals to privacy with also the, the First Amendment rights for uh, people and organizations. And I recognize the concern. Uh, you can contact your head of department or reach out to HR if you want to have a deeper conversation or reach out to me if you want to talk about this in more depth. Thanks, Ginger. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like that's all we have in the Q&A for now. So Great. I'm going to turn it back over to Lenny. All right. Yeah. Thank you all. Thanks, Harrison. Thank you, Ginger. Um, you know, folks out there, um, 
if you think of other questions for Ginger, uh, if, if you're going to be around for uh, yeah. for William's uh, talk, then if you think of other questions about privacy and information, uh, please type those in. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, uh, I would like to uh, introduce William Smith, who is also with the Seattle Information Technology Department. William is a passionate HR professional that has a wide range of skills stemming from IT, HR, and business. And it is this background that makes him a successful HR professional. William is a graduate of Hazen High School in Renton, Washington, and holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Information Technology from the University of Phoenix, as well as a Master's of Jurisprudence in Labor and Employment Law from Tulane Law School. He also holds certifications in the field of HR as well as IT. William brings a wealth of knowledge from the profit as well as not-for-profit arenas. He is experienced in HR organizational development, employee and labor relations, risk management, workforce planning, and employment and strategic business management, union negotiations, and strategy. William is a committed father and volunteers as a board member supporting families at nonprofit organizations looking to reestablish father child relationships. William, thank you so much for uh, being here. I've uh, enjoyed our uh, uh, conversations um, on LinkedIn, and uh, you, you are, I believe, are going to talk to us about human resources. You're now live. Thank you, Lenny, so much. Um, and thank you, uh, Age Friendly Seattle, for welcoming um, myself and my colleague, Ginger Armbruster, um, to present um, with you. Um, it is certainly my pleasure um, to present to you or bring to you kind of some things that Human Resources in Seattle IT is doing in relation to an Age Friendly Seattle. And I wanna first go over kind of what kind of HR is. Uh, many people have a different definitions and thoughts about kind of what HR is to them. So I just kind of want to give a baseline of kind of how HR operates within the Seattle IT context. Um, familiarize yourself with my team, kind of the services that we provide to our staff, and some things that we are doing to bring forth um, in age friendly Seattle in context of the um, age, uh, age livability uh, context. So ultimately within Seattle IT, as Ginger uh, said previously, we have roughly 700 or so employees. We have both represented and non-represented employees. Um, there are two unions within our um, workforce. Um, so within that, our core services really are labor relations, employee relations, talent acquisitions, i.e. recruitment, um, the ability to position manage benefits, maintaining employee records, compliance, and investigations. And all those things really uh, detail out how we provide our services to the 700 plus employees. Some of our desired services um, that we are looking to transition from and into being more of a, a business partner slash strategic partners to our, our business partners, as well as being a more metric based resources so that we are able to supply and provide the right amount of information and data to our staff on a regular basis. Next slide, please, Lenny. And so looking at it from a holistic standpoint in terms of the big picture, what is HR? It's really a multitude of different things. Um, there is uh, strategic possibilities, the corporate diversity, hiring, workplace, economy, really management, you know, the hiring and firing, you know, stealing up staff, the, the representation of people and ma making that the primary focus, looking at the organization from a in a broad standpoint and being strategic. So if you look at that and say, okay, wow, there's a lot of things in the HR bucket. Well, you're absolutely right. Um, there are many things that make up uh, the concept of what and who HR is as, as a whole. Um, and this is what this slide represents. Lindy, next slide, please. And so within Seattle IT, these are the, this is my team. Um, we have Sandy Paloka that has been with um, 
the city for quite some time. She spent a large amount of her time um, in Seattle Center. She has um, 20 plus years of experience within um, the city of Seattle. Janice Flagon is also another member of my team. She has over 30 plus years within the Seattle IT. Mylene and Melanie, they're some of my newer members on my team. Mylene has 20 plus years of experience. Melanie is a, a, a newer member uh, to my team, but they both bring um, a whole host of different experiences in terms of the HR field, and I'm very excited and happy to have them on the team. Uh, Lawan Hammond and David Run. David Run serves as my labor relations lead, so he helps me out um, and helps the department out with all things labor relations. He's my go-to person and the staff's go-to person in terms of anything as far as the union-related um, things that we need to discuss. Lawan Hammond is she's more so a jack of all trades. She's my uh, benefits person as well as you know, works on our TLTs. And Jennifer Dawson Miller and, and, and Blue Cow. And Jennifer serves as also more so a, a journalist. She oversees our internship program. Um, she is also our safety officer, as well as um, helping us out in the recruitment areas in terms of uh, talent acquisition. Uh, Vu, um, he is really the data person uh, for the group and also allows us to provide metrics to our staff to make particular decisions. Next slide, please, Lane. And so kind of what is HR? Ultimately, HR for most organizations and businesses, um, the human resources department is responsible for managing job recruitment, um, developing and overseeing employee benefits, um, promoting and enforcing personnel policies, promote, promoting employee career development, um, orientation programs for new hires, i.e. also known as onboarding, providing guidance in regarding disciplinary actions, and serving as a primary contact for workforce injuries and accidents. And the, the, the idea of human resources for me has always been one where um, we are more than just, a, I think people really feel that sometimes HR becomes the place where, okay, if I'm in trouble or I need to do something, I need to go see the HR department. And that's kind of the total opposite of what I try and promote our department to be. Our department is really centered around to be an ally of the employee, to be a support base for the employee, to be able to provide that strategic division uh, uh, position and pu push forward what we need for employees in the organization to do. And we like to be that problem solver that every organization needs in order to function and produce uh, the, the highest possible work. Next slide, please, Lenny. And these are our core services. Um, we again provide labor relations, employee relations, talent acquisition, the idea of position management, benefits, personnel policies and records, compliance and investigations. And in terms of investigations, um, we have a, a centralized unit called SDHR within the Seattle IT. And so ultimately each department has their own HR function. And we like to use SDHR as the kind of the governing body. And I, I'm really looking at um, building those relationships with our SDHR counterparts and partners to make sure that we all are always on the same page. So when it comes to investigations and things like that, um, H SDHR has an HRIU unit where we like to utilize them to help uh, us in our investigation. So the employee also feels like there is a neutral party that is investigating um, any complaint that we may have to have um, attention on. We also have a section of health and wellness and our idea of performance management. Um, we really believe in the concept of performance management being more than just a performance review at the end of the year. Performance management is really centered around what can the organization do for the employee and manager and the relationship throughout the year to make sure that the employee and the manager are doing what they're supposed to be doing in terms of is the employee producing um, the amount of work that they have signed up to produce, i.e. in their job description, is the manager providing the right level of support to support that employee to be the best possible employee that they can. So it is, we like to um, make sure that is a dual effort and not just focused on the employee, but also focused on management. And again, safety, is a big part of our work, leave management, onboarding, workforce planning and compensation management. So all of these are 
Seattle IT's core services that we provide to our staff. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the desired service, it's OK, let's look at our organization and I'm always in the in the method of OK, what can we do better? How can we continue to turn our service around to make sure that our employees are receiving everything that they possibly need in order to be successful? And one of and well, actually three of the things that I am looking at uh, making sure that we're transitioning into is a being a metrics driven service. So being able to provide uh, that level of information, that level of knowledge um, based on data and numbers to say, hey, this is this is how this is showing up and being able to build trends off of that. Turning the department from a, a um, trans less transactional and more strategic. Um, I think people often relate HR to sometimes, OK, we go to them when we need X done. Well, that might be true, but there's also another huge part of HR, which means the strategic piece of it, which helps the business move in terms of any business decision that is needed throughout the organization to help it flourish and get to its endpoint. And the idea of career de development, that is a huge um, sticking point for me. We have recently embarked on a effort called talent and development <clears throat> where we are looking at really upscaling our employees, making sure that they have the right resources in order to be successful and really putting that effort into making sure our workforce is skilled up at the best possible level to provide the right possible service for our partners within IT. Next slide, please, Lenny. OK, so when we talk about the eight domains of livability regarding an age friendly Seattle, I looked at it and I said, OK, transportation, uh, that's not really HR, but we could, you know, that's certainly within the city scope. Housing, eh, not really HR, outdoor spaces and buildings, social participation, uh, respect and social inclusion, community and health services and communication and information. And in all of those, civic participation and employment is kind of where HR would really fall in the eight domains of livability. So I want to go over some things that we have been thinking about and are thinking about on how we can relate to this particular subject within civic participation and employment for the eight domains of livability. Lenny, can you go to the next slide, please? So what we are doing and what we are thinking about in terms of rolling out within Seattle IT. Uh, previously, I mentioned our talent development efforts where we feel that in order to be um, what we have in our in our division called the best in class in digital service, that our, our talent pool, our employees need to have the, the best opportunity to continue to increase their skills. And as an organization, we look at it as our responsibility to make sure that the employees have the necessary resources in order to do that. However, in that we shift to our internship opportunities that we look at that as part of our talent development efforts. But when we talk about an age friendly Seattle internships does, don't necessarily mean that, OK, well, we have this person coming in right out of college that they're the only ones that are able to fulfill this particular opportunity. No, we like to look at it in the reverse and say all individuals have an opportunity to be part of Seattle IT. We really want to kind of destroy the mantra that the, the, the subject or um, the work of IT is just um, work that is centered around maybe a younger generation where that's that's the furthest thing from the truth. There's plenty of opportunities um, for everyone to be a part of IT and we are looking at breaking those barriers so that people understand that and they know that there are opportunities within Seattle IT for everyone. Um, volunteer opportunities. Um, we like to we're pushing out a program right now where we're looking at volunteering or letting people know that there's volunteer opportunities within Seattle IT. Um, the flexibility on remote remote workforce. This really came to head during this COVID situation where we really had to look at how are we doing business? Is it the most um, susceptible to success for our, our staff and, and the people that we serve? And we are there's a real focus on being able to do your work from your home and is it possible to do so? So some of the things that Ginger touched on earlier, 
It is a concentrated effort throughout Seattle IT to make sure that we are doing this and doing this in the right way. Virtual career fairs. The, the idea of career fairs often, um, there is this picture of, okay, I go to this place, I walk up, I hand someone my resume, I talk to them about my skills, they tell me, okay, you fit X, Y, and Z, here you go, we have an opportunity for you. We are really looking at taking that and making it virtual because what many studies have shown that, you know, there's still, regardless of how much you promote it, there's still a segment of people that may not feel comfortable operating in that fashion. So we are looking at ways to have a virtual career fair where we limit and any possibility of anyone saying, I didn't have an opportunity to uh, look at that job or move forward in, in an application with that job. And so we want to make sure that we send the message that we um, are inclusive and that everyone is welcome to um, apply for any job within Seattle IT. Constantly monitoring our internal policies, um, that is huge for us as well. We always want to make sure that our policies are just, we want to make sure that our policies are fair and equitable um, across the board for everyone. Um, in that, we we run pay and equity analysis, which falls right into that. We look at demographics. We look at, okay, who is being paid the most in the organization? How can we balance this out? We look at the why, and we adjust our practices based on that. And then last but not least, talent acquisition, which is essentially rec recruiting and everything that goes with it. That is a huge part when we talk about an age-friendly Seattle and what Seattle IT can do in terms of the HR efforts is that how are we looking at um, our candidates? Where are we uh, promoting our jobs at? Um, who are we bringing in for an, for an interview? Who are we giving opportunities to? And these are all things that we are looking at to make sure that we are inclusive of all people. Lenny, next slide. And so, if there are any questions that I can answer for you going forward, I would love the dialogue. Um, if there are ideas that you would love to send my way, um, I am always more than happy to, to listen. Um, so if you are want to email me, my email address is william.smith at seattle.gov. That phone number goes right to my office. That connects right to my um, office cell phone number as well, so you'll always be able to reach me. And if you are looking for um, jobs on our website, you can always go to www.seattle.gov.jobs and our um, listings and postings will live on that site as well. Um, thank you so much uh, for having me. Thank you so much for having Seattle IT a part of this um, and more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, William. I do appreciate this this overview. And uh, I got to say, I uh, even before um, virtual career fairs were in fashion, uh, they were my my preferred way of uh, um, looking and applying for jobs. So right. uh, I'm glad this is growing, um, and uh, hopefully, folks take advantage of it. I'll, I'm going to go uh, directly to Harrison. Uh, because there was a question there uh, specific to older adults, I believe. So Harrison, uh, what are folks saying? Um, thanks, Lenny. Yeah, so we have a few questions in here. I'm just going to kind of go down the list. So the first question we have here is, um, how did you get into HR service? Yeah, great question. Um, so my mother um, was in HR uh, for a very long time. And as a young adult, you know, I used to see her um, really, she, she used to bring work home all the time. And I said to myself as, as, as a young child, I said, I would never do that. You're what you're doing, mom. And she said to me, we'll see. <laughs> and so she kind of left it at that. And, you know, as I got older and, uh, kind of you know trying to find my way and kind of what i felt passionate about there were really two things that really stood out for me one was was people um, i've always loved to to be able to interact and, and, and socialize with people and the other was solving problems and uh, that really came to a head for me when when one of my first jobs was at jc penney's i was a shoe salesman 
And I was able to utilize my skills in kind of relating to people as well as solving problems. And the very first job that I had within HR was at the Postal Service. And that I used that as kind of the stepping stone to launch my career. Great question. Great. Thanks, William. Yep, no problem. Um, the next question we have here is, uh, how do you directly help bring resources to age-friendly community? So I would like to kind of get a little bit more is detail around that question. When we talk about resources, what are we referring to? Because if it's more so centered around, if we talk about resources, you know, sometimes I look think at that money or, or, or people to help. Um, in my role, um, again, the, the pieces that I touched on, those are ways in which I can influence in terms of uh, resources to an age friendly community is, you know, how are we recruiting for our jobs? Where are we posting for our jobs? Are we making sure that there is a diverse candidate pool for, for every role? And so those are the sorts of things that I am doing from my seat and my position of power, if you will, to influence that. But if there are, if there's other examples in terms of resources that you're referencing, I'm more than happy to entertain uh, that question. I just need a little bit more detail. OK, thanks. Yeah, um, we'll see if uh, if uh, there's any follow up about that. But okay. in the meantime, we have another question that's asking for um, uh, what are some examples of the volunteer opportunities? I know you had it listed on um, I think it was the slide just before this. So, yeah, so we have several people within our RSJI program that is working on um, working on building a volunteer opportunity. So right now we have some we're in conversations with a few organizations that have direct connections to uh, Seattle IT where we will be helping individuals come in and have those volunteer volunteer opportunities that are connected to Seattle IT through our race and social justice program. So the list itself um, could be a whole host of different things. It's really being fleshed out right now. So the, the intimate details of that, I would be unable to share because we are still in negotiation phases of it. But again, uh, the slide that I sent was centered, centered around more so about how and what we are doing to move forward with an age from Seattle. But if, if you can reach out to me via my contact information, I will be more than happy to send you that list personally. Um, just, just send me an email and let me know that uh, you heard me speak in the, uh, the age friendly presentation and I'll get that information over to you. Great, thanks William. Yep. Um, it looks like that is all we have for now, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back to Lenny. Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, again, William. Um, uh, that's very, very encouraging to know that these things are happening. That uh, you know, we that we as a city are committed to you know dismantling institution institutionalized racism and ageism that we know exists. Uh, and I, I think internships is is a good example where you know we can use um, you know. Harrison is a good example of somebody who is uh, just getting, um, you know, familiar with the industry, but then we could maybe um, employ the experience of people who have uh, uh, have a wealth of experience. Uh, and uh, so that's that's it's great that the city is looking at that. So thank you, William. Thank you, Ginger. Um, thank you, Nancy. Uh, I haven't forgotten that you were, you were here. Um, and, and Harrison and Michael for for uh, for helping us put this together. And uh, most of all, um, thank you all of you for for joining us. Um, uh, in closing, uh, I always like to uh, remind folks about the resource that we at the city contract with, which is Community Living Connections, um, and that's a. Uh, it's a group of organizations in communities around Seattle and King County, and they used used to welcome folks to just walk in and 
kind of ask what um, you know what they were looking for, and if they couldn't uh, provide support, then they would refer to another organization and network. Now with uh, phase reopening, some of them uh, may not have walk-in hours or they may be limited. We've had some representatives from this Community Living Connections Network on our show in previous weeks, and we will have them back again. So looking forward to learning how um, they're starting up again. So again, the number is 844-348-5464. Uh, and the website is communitylivingconnections.org. That's our show for today. And I want to remind you that the companion show um, for uh, Aging King County and, and for Age Friendly Seattle is called Close to Home, Stories of Health, Tech and Resilience. And we'll, uh, we'll be on a week from today. And we hope that you will come back and join us uh, at the same place at the same time. Until then, be well, stay engaged, um, and let us know what we can do to make this city a better place to grow up and grow old. Please take care and we'll see you next time.